Well, I'm Winston Taylor, and uh, my wife is Kristen, and she's Dr. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she loves to take pictures. She likes really great pictures, so she's out taking pictures of her. But um, anyway, uh, Kristen and I uh, grew up and married in uh, Little Rock. We grew up there and had our daughter at... <coughs> When my daughter was in first grade, we moved to Russellville. We've been in Russellville about um, 30, 30 plus years. And <clears throat> so uh, when I was in Little Rock, um, after my military service, I uh, had a GI Bill. So I discovered I had some uh, money to spend on tuition. So I, at first I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but then I uh, didn't take long and I um, went to UALR, which is right there in town, so convenient. They had a great art program, and so that's where I went to school, U University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And um, I graduated from there with the BA, and uh, that's where I had my formal training, I guess you would say. But even after that, um, I did take workshops and um, as much as I can. And um, I was really privileged to uh, take a workshop with a really well-known, he's called the father of rock pottery, mm -hmm. which I've done for years. And um, his name is Paul Solomon. And I took his workshop in um, Aspen, Colorado, at Snowbass Village. Mm -hmm. It influenced me a lot. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he works really loose and spontaneous. And um, so I was really, like I say, influenced by that. And it showed up in my work. So uh, I learned so much from him, I wanted to try out things that he taught us. And so my work started off really loose and, and like Paul Solner. Uh, the next summer, I think it was, uh, we went to Mesa Verde and I took a part to uh, Gunnison, Colorado, and took a workshop with a well-known, uh, well, <clears throat> yes, um, well-known potter named Adelphia Martinez. Um, she is the niece of, of the famous uh, Maria Martinez and lived in the same village or Pueblo. So um, I came back and did lots of black pots like Maria and um, we learned uh, carving and and textures and things that I incorporated in some of those pieces I did at that time. Um, I worked at the Art Center in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas Art Center, and um, I worked there teaching uh, children and also getting uh, pottery. This wasn't long after my, and I took a, after my graduation, and I'm backing up in time a little bit too, but um, I wanted to say that while I was there, I got lucky to take some other workshops that influenced my work, and uh, with um, a guy named Harvey Sadow, uh, who's a well-known uh, Raku artist, just as far as I know, he's still doing Raku, but he, um, throws extremely up on the wheel, on the potter's wheel, and he throws extremely um, thin, and his vessels, uh, I was invited to pick one up by him, so I picked, it just felt like a balloon in my hands, it was so big, and I was, uh, so I practiced throwing and throwing and throwing, I wanted to throw like Harvey said out, and, do, and I was still working on it. <laughs> anyway, uh, that guy could really uh, do some wonderful stuff on the wheel. 
and he influenced me in that direction. And uh, I've taken another workshop that uh, was in Pensacola, Florida, and um, it was uh, Peter King, and he makes uh, large-scale uh, architectural work. And so, in fact, he calls himself an architectural ceramicist. And he truly is because he makes facades and sinks and shower stalls and all amazing stuff. And so I learned a lot of things from him. Uh, um, like I say, I've been influenced by all these different uh, ceramic artists and, and it was reflected in my work. And then, um, then I discovered I'm really more, I'm not that loose. Um, I like precision and I like measurement and I like uh, constructing. So, um, and something I haven't told you is I have a nine year background in uh, doing automobile body repair work, which really is a little bit of sculpting. And uh, some of the techniques uh, that you use in uh, repairing automobiles, um, I have actually used in my studio today. It may not necessarily be on a pot, but in something I needed to make something else. And in architecture, um, I love architecture. And I see stuff, uh, you know, that I think maybe, I was thinking something funny. Um, I, we were in an elevator, Chris and I was in an elevator somewhere. I think it was a hotel. We had been Holiday Inn, but they had this cool looking door um, on the uh, elevator. And it had this pattern in it. I was, I was enamored with that pattern in the door. I wonder how I could do that. Uh, so the, when I see stuff like that, it you know may affect me that way or not. And um, I, so I have this mechanical background. I love architecture, and I think that's all starting to enter into my work. Um, these pieces here are the latest, very latest pieces I've done. Um, there are some others. Um, or the, the, what I'm starting to experiment, let's put it this way. Like I say, I did everything here uh, for this exhibit. <clears throat> but um, these pieces that are on this wall, except for this one, are, uh, I use under glazes. Uh, you, can, you know what that is. And I'm trying some new things with that. So it's pretty recent. I haven't done a lot of them yet. Uh, so this is, kind of a direction I'm moving in. And then these wall boxes, these are new. I don't think I've done more than six. Uh, I, I sold two in Little Rock and in Calorie, and then these four uh, are the last ones. And then there's some other work in here that is reflective of what I've been doing for all these years. Um, uh, this this one, uh, which is called Sagar Firing, uh, this sculpture, and then um, there's some others. Uh, right over here on this wall is another uh, Sagar uh, fired piece. Uh, can you talk I can. About that a bit? Sagar I'm sorry. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, I will. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and then uh, I will. Hold that one. And, and then this piece here is one of a kind here. Uh, this one is uh, made from a micaceous clay. And um, so that's the color of the clay plus some uh, ferric chlorides uh, <clears throat> sprayed on it and horsehair burned on the surface. So that's, uh, that's the lone piece that has that technique on it. So, it's not, not, um, not mica applied? I'm sorry? Not mica applied, but it, it's in the clay? Yes, it's, okay. it's, so it's mixed areas. into the clay bottom. It's uh, naturally occurring in some places. About sagar firing, um, sagar 
uh, loosely defined is uh, a container to fire pottery in. So it can be, uh, and of course potters use their imaginations a lot, so what I'm doing is uh, using uh, heavy aluminum foil and I spread it out on the workbench and I uh, dip the pot first in ferric chloride and uh, then I uh, wrap the pot like a big baked potato. And it has, before I enclose it, I put things like salt and seaweed and uh, copper wire and horsehair and things that combust and fume. And then um, as the kiln is heated up to about 1400, then uh, that fuming takes place during that period of time. And, after 15 or 20 minutes, you take it out and unwrap it and see what you got. So it's a little bit, you know, there's some spontaneity in it that I cannot control exactly. Uh, like for example, these two pieces here, they have very different colors. For some reason, this one uh, turned out with a lot more orange and yellow hues, and this one had more reds and yellows, a little bit of yellow and a little bit of orange. I was curious about that process uh, when you put horsehair or copper or whatever. How random is it? Or do you wet it and put it on there and just the way you want it? Or you just kind of toss it in there? Or how does that work? I try best I can to. Um, I, you're asking about the copper wire? Well, or the horsehair or whatever, you know. Are you looking for a certain pattern or is it, is it fairly random um, in there? Or how do you achieve again, that? Again, there's just a limited amount of that I can do, and I do as much as I can. Yeah. But um, yes, it is you know spontaneous, and that's, that's something that keeps me engaged with this process. Is that you know something different every time, and uh, I'm still excited by it. But uh, so, in answer to your question, um, there's there's some control. But, I think it's pretty neat that you have to lose control sometimes. Mm -hmm. That you have to uh, let go of your preconceived ideas and let what happens, happens. And I think most potters, would you agree that uh, this just is part of, the, part of our craft? Yeah. That you never have that, probably painting too, I guess. No? Oh, yeah. You have more control. The more you practice, the better you get, and the more. But, yeah. Is clay the, the top, or is it wood? <clears throat> the tops are clay. Um, it looks wood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they um, are, that's the construction I was speaking of, is assembling those tops. Like, let's see, that one right there has. Six, six part, six pieces joined together in it. I roll out a big slab and I cut a shape out of it and uh, then I put them together with slip and the tops are Raku fired. Uh, I put, uh, I just heat that piece up, the top in the Raku kiln and fire it and put it in a container with so uh, sawdust usually and smoke it real heavy and it makes it black. Mm -hmm. When I was handling that top after I had made the pot, I had mica all over my hands and you know and working with the clay I built the top with it transferred to the clay. And at first I was trying to sand it out. I said no no Leah I looked I like it. Let's see what happens when I fire this. Yeah. Because Michael looks great on a black background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sparkles like the sky. It's just it's really beautiful. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about these organic uh, found objects that you're attaching. Uh, how you go about choosing them and how you go about, they're so distinctly different from the form. How do you go about integrating the two, making it 
belong there? Well, I hope they're integrated um, <laughs> in the design of the piece. Um, it seems to me it seems to be more of a yin yang thing and juxtaposition or whatever you want to call it of the <clears throat> organic uh, piece and we collect those we Kristen and I hike and bike a lot and as much as we can and uh, I I look on the ground she gets on to me sometimes when I'm not looking up I run into stuff because I don't look up sometimes so anyway but I look on the ground and, and see wood that has uh, deteriorated in the ground and uh, or maybe it's on the edge of a stream bed and the way it's weather worn and, and all of that's just interesting to me and I know I'm not the only potter that puts uh, attaches found objects uh, like that but um, I, I love to do that also. Two questions. Um, do you find the wood and then make the pot for it, or do you make the pot and then attach the wood? And then do you treat the wood in any any way? Sometimes, uh, sometimes I just pick a piece of wood up mm -hmm. and I'm making a pot, and then I um, say, okay, I'm gonna put a piece of wood on this, and I'll uh, search through my stash of, of wood I've found uh, and you know find the right piece so I occasionally none of these look any good I'm gonna have to go out and look <laughs> more <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway so I find them now it's kind of funny um, this one here okay, funny. Uh, <laughs> this one uh, the cider fired pot um, we were in, we went earlier, well, it's in October, wasn't it? The Palo Duro uh, Canyon in West Texas. Y'all all Texans? You? Oh, Have you been there? Oh my goodness, I just thought it, it was awesome. They advertised it as the second largest canyon in the United States. And we were just you know, so impressed with it. But we went hiking there and I found that piece of wood. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh my goodness, that looked perfect on a cider fired pot. So <laughs> that's where it ended. <laughs> and uh, so I... Uh, and how did you go about attaching? Attaching? Yeah. They have, uh, yeah, that's the tricky part. Mm -hmm. um, I, I bore a, like an eighth inch hole into the bottom of the piece of wood and then provide one in the uh, lid um, and use a two-part epoxy and, and uh, glue it on there. Um, so, With metal? Hmm? With a metal rod? Yeah, it's got a metal pan yeah. inside to secure it. So they can be broken off, of course, but, um, you know, they're, they're on there quickly. They won't be when you unwrap your uh, saggers after you fire, do you then put a, a surface over this? Um, a wax or a spray or something to protect this surface? Oh, okay. As a protective coat, a protective measure. Um, I use a, a glue, a glue, <laughs> a uh, wax, a carnival wax. It's called tree wax, if yeah. you're interested. Mm -hmm. and, um, I started out using a Johnson's wax and found it was yellowing and the tree wax did not. And there's this expensive wax that I bought not long ago that comes in a little, I forgot the name of it, comes in a little uh, tin like that big, you know, and uh, it's way too much money in my opinion. Osmo? Hmm? Osmo? Is it called Osmo? No. No, I, I, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, uh, a lot of it's in a, a body that I probably lobby, I think. So, uh, and other artists and other mediums use it to seal. But yes, I seal that with, with tree wax. With tree wax. 
Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, like the kind of round black pots, those two, and the shapes, like the pattern you created on them? These pieces that will have the white mat uh, next to a shiny glaze, they're, uh, the color is from underglaze, it's called underglaze. Underglaze is fired on, and if you don't put the clear over it, then um, it's matte. And if you, and then of course the clear gloss makes the uh, gloss. The design is painted on also with underglaze, but that's done before the final uh, coat of uh, gloss glaze. They're fired in an electric kiln. Um, and uh, it's very easy to control uh, color. Uh, Underglazes are, generally speaking, very stable and predictable. So my spontaneity uh, quest is not quite there. Yes, it is. Sometimes they don't turn out really. <laughs> now, that is uh, This is rock and fire. Now, everybody that knows me, uh, especially Dr. Arkansas, knows that or thinks of me as a rock and potter. And uh, rightfully so, up and now I started doing some more of these uh, other techniques here recently. This is the only one that's really rock and um, Tell all for me with rock and mm -hmm. what rock and is. And um, it's a Japanese style of firing and a little bit unpredictable. But this is a uh, underglaze uh, with a gloss uh, clear Waku glaze over it. And then this is taped off with masking tape from my old body shop days. Uh, I, was, I was pretty good at masking things. So uh, this design is taped off and then peeled away after the glaze is applied. Then it's fired in the rock <laughs> kiln and wherever the tape was and the glaze is not there, that turns black and then uh, that's, you know, like that. So uh, this is rock food fire. That's, that's the last one I have of, so far of the labyrinth. But it is a labyrinth, and it's it's a, it blows people's mind to think you're going to see a labyrinth on a, a three-dimensional piece because we're used to seeing them on the mm -hmm. ground in tile or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a true labyrinth, and you know the concept of the labyrinth is uh, you go in, you enter in, and follow it. And if you stay between the boundaries and go, just stay on the in this case, on the glazed part, you'll come out at the top, up here at the top. Mm -hmm. If it were flat on the ground, uh, like a short Shorts Cathedral, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. someone more traveled than me. But um, anyway, the, one of the most famous ones is there at that cathedral. And so, but you know, when you, I can't describe it, I'm afraid. But um, it does adapt to uh, round work. But you know, the division and the lines and everything, that's exactly like the shorts that they've done a lot of these too. Nice. It has a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a spiritual meaning mm -hmm. to me. It's the idea of, you know, staying on a path yeah. and not turning back and not going astray. And then you end up. Ooh, that's great. At Thank the you. Exit, like we all do. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully our time within the labyrinth is quality. <laughs>